All right. Well, our presentation didn't make it over here, so uh, you guys will have to remember who we are sitting on stage. Um, so first off, thanks for joining the session. And uh, who was in the last session? So who stayed over from the consumer? Didn't? Okay. Well, cool. I know that we talked a little bit about uh, age uh, and age assurance. We're going to continue that conversation here today. I think it's important to kind of put some context to the age, uh, age assurance and age verification problem. About 15 years ago, I think this all changed our lives when we started having more digital platforms enter it. Uber, Airbnb, YouTube, now we have TikTok, et cetera. And uh, for the first 10 years, we really focused on solving fraud problems on those platforms within the trust and safety organizations. And now we've shifted not just to solving fraud, but also solving many other use cases around trust and safety, age being one of those very, very important use cases. And so just by uh, some numbers here in the US, about 97% of kids have access to social media, which is wild. 95% claim to use social media actively, that means daily. 45% have claimed that they are willing to lie or do lie to access content when they are asked for their age. So we know this is a fundamental problem that is part of our daily lives and part of our children's lives. Um, the second big thing about this is that over the last several years, there's been a, a call to action, not just by regulators and politicians, but by parents as well. And uniformly, everybody agrees this is a problem that is worth solving. Um, but as you guys may know, if you, if you watch the news, uh, there has been a lot of new regulations and new policies rolling out in this country and around the world. And in, in spirit, they're all trying to solve the same thing, but in practicality, they're all very different, which makes it extremely difficult to find the, the solution that will solve a problem for someone like Google, as an example, right? How do you comply with regulations in the UK and in Utah that want to shut down uh, the internet uh, for kids at night? as an example, right? So lots, lots to kind of focus on. Historically speaking, age has really been age gating. Who's gone through an age gate before, if I say age gate? All right, go to the website, put your, put your, uh, your age in there, and all of a sudden you can go on the website. Um, recently, we did a whole bunch of work. Travis, you want to tell us what site? <laughs> the Jewel website because Cameron, who works with us, loves his mango jewel pods, but you can't buy those now. Um, but, uh, you know, the Juul, uh, is everyone familiar with Juul, e-cigarette company, got in some trouble? Okay, really worthwhile reading about how state-by-state state attorney general's offices went in and, and took them to court and a class action lawsuit, and now they've settled all these. But one of the big pillars of this was not just marketing to kids, but also age verification. How were they conducting age verification for kids purchasing e-cigarette cartridges online? So there is some precedence, not too much, about how they were getting in trouble and for what and what the attorney generals were very interested in. But really, we don't have too many other use cases to kind of point at. Now, Liminal, if you guys know us, we like to put numbers around things. And, and we value this whole market at about a $10 billion opportunity today, growing at about a 16% CAGR, so a pretty decent sized market, and uh, there's not a whole lot of vendors in it, right? Yoti, who is just up here, is, is one of the more, you know, the innovator in this space. Um, there are several others, but for the most part, there's not a whole lot of vendors that are focused squarely on solving age verification, age assurance as a use case today, but instead we see a lot of uh, Me Too products that are coming out, identity verification players trying to solve this. So lots of opportunities uh, in this market. So hopefully uh, that's why you guys are in this room, to learn a little bit about that, maybe to help uh, build a solution that helps solve this. Um, I don't think we have an answer yet. So if you came here for answers, uh, hopefully we'll leave you with more questions and then we can kind of solve them. So that's a little bit of context. And so I want to just introduce the panelists here, or at least let them introduce themselves. So uh, why don't we actually start with the guy with the microphone? It makes a lot more sense. So Philip, who are you? What do you do? Why are you sitting on the stage? Uh, Philip Verley, product manager at Google. I work on the age assurance program at Google. Before that, I was at Airbnb working on trust and safety. 
which uh, we all believed was rooted in identity. If you have a strong identity, that is the foundation of trust. Because if you don't know who you're dealing with, then all the checks you do after that, whether that's sanction screening, background checking, anti-money laundering checks, KYC checks, garbage in, garbage out. And so for us, identity was that foundation of trust. And as Travis was painting, you know, it all started, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago when these marketplaces popped up and folks like, oh, we should try to figure out who's who. Banks do it, let's just do KYC. That didn't really work, right? Because banks are very local, these global marketplaces are global. And so they had to look for other ways to verify who was touching these platforms, whether that's from a guest, driver, host, passenger side. Then they said, okay, well, if that doesn't work, hmm, that's how the GovID space popped up, right? We have tons of vendors now that do GovID verification. Age Assurance pops up recently, two, three, four years ago. How the hell are we gonna solve this? Hmm, let's use GovIDs. That doesn't work either, right? Because as we get into it, it's proportional, privacy, and has to be inclusive. GovIDs are not that. So there's a lot of parallels to draw from typical KYC to the marketplaces to now where we are protecting children online. And so the exciting part about this space for me it's unsolved, right? Like we are trying, we're working towards solutions, but they're not solved. Don't tell me, oh, just collect name, address, date of birth, social security number, gov ID. That doesn't work, right? It does not work for this uh, space. So that's the exciting part. And that's why I'm excited to be here, not just to talk about it, but hopefully also learn from folks in the room that are looking at these solutions as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so Scott Eddington, CEO and co-founder of, of Deep Labs, I've spent well, I'm getting old, the last 25 years of my career, primarily in the singles intelligence space. So, you know, started my career off back in Washington, D.C., primarily serving the U.S. intelligence agencies and the DOD, and then spent about 10, 12 years doing that, and then moved to, be to actually San Francisco to become Visa's first global head of research and development and new product innovation, which is basically a fancy way of saying one half of the day I spent geeking out, building cool algorithms and models and playing with machine intelligence, now everyone would call it AI. Um, and the other half of the day, I'd spent actually working on the front lines with the large issuers and large merchants all around the world to make sure that the network was safe, that we could actually deliver on our brand promise in terms of making sure that it actually is you that's making that transaction, um, or even, you know, even you know, further down the line, making sure that money movement that's being pushed across the network is being used for non-nefarious purposes. And so, to, you know, to your earlier point, Travis, you know, one of the things that I'm super excited about with, with this session is to actually learn from folks like yourselves, because ultimately there is no sort of one solution to rule them all. Um, it's gonna be a cadre of solutions, and it's gonna to have to be um, a, a bit of a give and take as it relates to what the consumer needs from a non-friction perspective, but also marrying up to make sure that there is in fact a, a true trust and safety, because you don't want that undermining the brand um, of any organization, let alone making sure that uh, the children are safe. Yeah, absolutely. Philip, gonna turn it back over to you. Um, you've obviously laid out a little bit louder than I remember, but uh, thanks, Galad. Galad is now back there being DJ, so that's good. Um, so, Philip, you, you've kind of you know you've laid out already a little bit about the history, but you know, can you maybe define the problem statement a little bit more in terms of the Google problem statement? I think everybody kind of wants to know how this actually relates to your day to day. Yeah, no. Um... As, as you mentioned again in your opening remarks, and I don't know what to do with my legs. These chairs are really <laughs> awkward. Um, but as you mentioned, right, there's, there's not a lot of regulations that everybody gets behind, right? This is one that everyone gets behind. Parents, regulators, politicians, state of Utah, state of California, state of New York, countries like the UK, all of Europe, Southeast Asia. Everybody's like, raise your hand. Do you not want to protect children online? Nobody's going to raise their hand. So this is the one regulation that's really nobody's going to touch, right? Everybody's like, you're going to protect children, right? Absolutely. We'll do what it takes. And so that is, you know, one, a stroke of genius, but it also it was well overdue, right? Because the Internet is an interesting place. There's a lot of good. There's also a lot of weirdness. And so making sure that we protect children online is one of the big things. Um, what does it do for us? One of the things that's um, difficult with it is we had an event, I think it was in, what are we now? June? It was in March, right? June 1? Yeah, March. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
You know, I didn't go. I, yeah, I know. You, you were not invited. Galad was, Galad was invited. Um, <laughs> but we had an event, and it, and it hit me at that time. There was a French regulator, an Irish regulator, and a UK regulator on stage, all talking about age assurance and protecting children, all saying the same things, all agreeing with each other. But when it comes to the ap application of those regs, they did not care what the one was doing versus the other. They just cared about their constituents, about what their uh, citizens needed or wanted. And so for us, being a global company, or anyone on the internet, it's not just Google, it's any social media, any e-commerce player, anyone that does advertising, anyone that does personalization, you're on the hook, right? And so the French regulator has their own interpretation of how they're gonna protect children. UK regulator, Irish regulator, you name it. They all have a different flavor. And so that is now leading towards how do we make sure we can keep balancing those regulations with the user experience, right? Because they basically say, if you don't want to do it, that's fine too. Treat everyone as a child. Guess what? You won't have any products to sell. You won't have any products to use. It just doesn't become that useful for anyone with an account. And so that is one thing that is, we are going to see this splintering and it's going to continue to splinter. U.S. is another great example of that. California was first out the door, and then all of a sudden said, Utah, Utah says, hmm, we hate social media, right? We're gonna nail that one down, and we're gonna really figure that piece out. Montana, I think it's Montana, just banned TikTok, right? They banned them. Uh, and I think they declared war on China as well in that bill. <laughs> Not sure how they're gonna do that, um, but it's interesting. Then you have other states like Texas who are now raising the bar again. You have Florida that's doing things. So it's just, it's just gonna be splintered. And so I think the challenge for anyone that has online presence, how do you, one, manage those regulations? How do you balance the privacy, right? Because we can collect all this data. That's not what this intent is. How do you manage privacy? How do you make sure it's proportional to the, the use case? Jewel is a great example. You should collect GovID probably. You should probably collect name, address, date of birth. Watching a video online, not sure that's proportional. And then, um, you know, the last piece is the user experience. How do we make sure that you get a great experience across products while still knowing where you are, how to enforce those regulations? So I think that's something that's really challenging. And it's obviously we have a big target. TikTok's a big target. Meta's a big target. But just like we saw with GDPR, after the first two, three fines came out, all of a sudden everybody complied. It's happening. If you haven't heard of age regulations, please look it up. It is going to hit your business. Yeah. And with that, I mean, you just mentioned a few companies. How, how, like, what is the solution today? Uh, we're all going at it alone, right? And we are trying to figure out, is that the right approach? Or should we look at it as a industry? And when I say industry, it's not just big tech. It's also regulators. It's privacy folks. It's kid protection agencies. It's politicians. How does this industry vendors, right? How do we all come together and figure out what do we do that makes sense as I mentioned, the balancing of the proportionality to privacy and the experience while still meeting that regulation. And Scott, you know, the reason why we invited you on this panel was obviously Philip, I mean, you've been doing this since, uh, what, 1945, 1950? No, you, no, really, you've been uh, early days in the internet with prepaid cards doing KYC checks for 20 something years, right? And, but so there's a, a, there's a consistent approach to how identity is kind of rolled out around you. Um, Scott, I mean, you're a PhD, you're a doctor, you, you, uh, you built R&D for, for Visa. They still use all the stuff that you guys built 10 years ago uh, for their fraud and risk engines. You take a fundamentally different look at this with more of an AI lens. How does AI, since that is a major topic at this conference, how does AI play a role in things like age assurance when we're talking about identity and trying to do something more passive. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd also mention beyond just you know, my visa days doing AI, I would say that you know, a large part of what sort of my claim to fame was in my early part of my career was actually building out you know, machine intelligence to support the, the mission, for lack of a better term, right? We mission. don't want to know about your NSA, CIA no, 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 days. Well, yeah. well, nor can I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I guess what I would offer is that, that what's interesting is that some of the same techniques that were reserved just for the nation state actors. Again, for us, an actor can be a consumer, can be a human being, can be a bot, can be an organization, could be a, oh, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, it could be, you know, a, an actor can be a, a, a nation state, it can be a consumer, it can be a bot, 
it can be an organization, frankly, is agnostic from it's from agnostic from the, from the perspective that anything that can create a new event or a new phenomenon, right? And so some of the same techniques that we were using back at some of those places I used to work are now fully commoditized, right? And it's brought about because of the compute now being relatively inexpensive, AWS, GCP, et cetera, Azure, all the way to the fact that now some of these AI capabilities have also become commoditized. So, again, I'm going to age myself, but we used to call them script kitties, right? The, the kids would be in, the, in their basement doing sort of weird things online to, to hack into the different sites and everything else. Well, those, those capabilities have advanced to the point where I would argue that in the year 2020, 2023, things you can find on, online now for free in terms of some of the, the toolkits are far more advanced than even, let's say, what many of the governments used to use even five or six years ago. Right, it's a scary prospect, super scary. And so, you know, again, I don't want to buzzword bingo you guys to death, but then, you know, the notion of like deep fakes and all that fun stuff, fully commoditized. And so I share it with you only, only to say from an AI perspective, going back to your direct question, from an AI perspective, these tools, these machine intelligence tools are fully commoditized to this point, to, to the point where now, to your, earlier, to your earlier statement, it becomes very difficult to balance the act of not increasing friction, because you don't want to affect the user experience, but at the same time, still maintain that trust. And so, you know, whether it be a, a prepaid card from yesteryear, um, or whether it be just, you know, logging on for the first time to, to YouTube as, as an example, the reality is that the tools and techniques we've been using for the last even two years are gone, right? From a, you know, let's say from a signal perspective, one of the things that I've always enjoyed in talking about and sort of the core thesis is context really is everything. Right, it's literally the core thesis. And what I mean by that simply is, uh, you know, Scott Eddington sitting in front of you today, um, you know, third day of, of, a, of, a, of a nice conference is actually much different than the Scott Eddington on Saturday, Soccer Dad Scott, right? Soccer Dad Scott likes to run around and, you know, hang out, play, hang, hang out with the dog and all that fun stuff. But from an identity perspective, it's still Scott, but obviously my persona will have shifted based on space, based on time, based on context. And so that same basic understanding of, of personas again, from an AI perspective, are now being leveraged both for good, but also for bad. And so these techniques, these tools are readily available. They can now be leveraged to undermine the credibility of some of these, these trusted brands, for lack of a better term, which makes it very, very difficult, frankly, even for the regulators, because often, oftentimes the regulators will then come down with a heavy hand to make sure that, oh, we made sure the kids are taken care of. Well, have you also then stopped commerce as well? Right, and that was kind of the question I wanted to ask, which is, you know, what is the ethical considerations? What are, you know, how should we be thinking about AI when we want to improve user experience, but we're talking about ch children, we're talking about age assurance? Yeah, you know, again, I don't pretend to have the, the complete answer. I would say the, let me tell you about a challenge. So data, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so never in our, you know, to sound, you know, I use too much hyperbole, but never in our history have we had this much access to as much data. Right. So just because you have access to it, does that mean you should use it? Right. Does the data you use to build your fundamental models or your decision capabilities, is it represent, truly representative of the larger set? I, are you going to introduce bias in a way you didn't even know you are introducing bias because of the data you, you're collecting? How long do you actually keep that data? How long do you, do you actually age that signal? Um, again, sorry to geek out for a second, but if, you know, if you're aging a signal too quickly, well, then you run the risk of, again, introducing friction. If you age it too long, well, then you and to bring the efficacy down of, of the decision capability. So I would say there's no sort of clean answer. I would, just say, I would just mention that the fact that because of all these signals that are now readily available and because regulation has, or is attempting to catch up with the age of AI, there will be a number of, in my, my opinion, some heavy-handed approaches by some of the regulators, which might have unintended consequences. Yeah. And Philip, just to kind of lean in, because I think ethical considerations is one thing. we. We talk a lot about privacy up here, but one of the things that you mentioned earlier that we, as a collective group, I haven't actually really heard it much at all during this conference, which is about bias in models. And I know at Airbnb, bias was a major concern. So, you know, how do we not repeat some of the uh, some of the historical issues with platforms, especially when we're trying to verify people online? Yeah, absolutely. Um when I, when I joined Airbnb, that was one of the, you know, belong anywhere, right? And one of those things, you know, wasn't happening at that time because they were disproportionately not letting a certain amount of guests book. And so we had to figure out, well, what, what can we do to give everybody a fair shot? And it starts, it starts with the onboarding, right? Like 
making sure that you, you know, iPhone versus Android. In your brain, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, oh, iPhone users, more, more money, they're richer. Like, all of a sudden, that immediately can creep in, right? Um, and when you're talking around age assurance, you got to figure out, can you use all of the techniques you're trying to do, whether that's to try to figure out uh, whether an adult through credit card, gov ID, biometrics, is it fair for all your users, right? Um, in Europe, credit cards not that prevalent. Gov IDs are, but credit cards are not. So maybe we have a half solution, right? In the US, credit cards are everywhere, but Gov IDs aren't that prevalent, right? Especially in underrepresented minorities, we're talking maybe just over 60%. And so you have to really look at how are your solutions meeting your users? And you got to figure out who are your users, right? Because that's, that's the key. Um, I don't think we want to exclude anyone. I think everybody's looking for the next 10% of growth. Look at that, right? Look at trying to figure out are your solutions truly keeping the folks out you want to keep out? Or do they have some unintended consequences that you're not looking at? And you talked about proportionality earlier. What does that, what does that mean? So I guess it's a definition that I know you, you've been using for years at Google, but for this group here, what, what does proportionality mean and, and kind of how does that work in practical terms? Yeah, so pr proportionality for us is, um, and it ties into context as well, right? It ties into use case, context, and proportionality. all go together. Um, again, if you are ordering a vape pen online, which I don't think you can do anymore, but back in the day you could, you probably expect that you're going to provide some information to verify yourself. You open a bank account, you know exactly what you're going to bring, and you know exactly what you have to offer up. That is proportional to the use case and the context. Now, fast forward to age assurance regulations, and let's say you try to hit Instagram or Google or you know, TikTok or whatever, and you want to watch a video, you want to watch a clip, and all of a sudden you get stopped. Hey, you got to provide us a Gov ID or a credit card to prove your age. The proportionality is just not there. So us trying to match what banks do or financial service or alcohol, tobacco companies it is not proportional to the use case we are in front, right? It's content. You're consuming content versus getting a service or a good. So the proportionality has to match that use case. And the, and the context matters because users, again, I'm sure everybody's watched a YouTube video before. You do it three, four in a row, and all of a sudden you get stopped. Contextually, you're like, what the hell just happened, right? versus at a bank, you know exactly what you have to do. So you gotta try to find the right moment where you can prompt the user to provide that extra piece of data. And one piece of data, right? Whether that's your face, your voice, maybe it's a credit card, maybe something else, but that's the proportionality angle. And so over collecting is very much discouraged by regulators, but then they also say, you better be sure. So again, it's a very hard balance that we walk, right? It's a, it's a tightrope, you're walking a tightrope. And so that's the proportionality angle. Yeah, and Scott, sorry, we have to keep passing these uh, this back and forth. Scott, how does that work with an AI model or even with Deep Labs, which is bigger than an AI model? But how does proportionality work? I know you, you call con it context, but maybe for everybody here, how do you kind of marry those two things up? Yeah, I mean, I think Philip's spot on. It, it comes down to use case, right? So there are certain use cases where you have to, have to be 99% you know, certain it actually is that person who they say they are versus someone where, you know, the threshold could easily be 80% because I just want to make sure that it's a human being we're onboarding to the platform. Now, the minute they actually want to, you know, you know, push commerce or they actually want to have some sort of financial transaction, then the threshold dynamically has to be, you know, common itself has to be up above 90% as an example. And to be very clear, it's going to be based on not only just use case, but also jurisdiction, um, geography, um, sort of everyone knows this, but obviously, but, you know, certain restrictions in the, e in the EU in terms of what that is considered PII versus the US, versus California, versus certain states. And so from a, you know, from a fundamental building of a, of, of a model or building of an algorithm, you also have to build uh, geo-specific models, right? So we build and have built even in my previous lives. Um, in Latin America, there might be three or four different Latin American models. And that's based off of per country, per use case, per regulation, right? Same thing in Europe, EU versus the UK, as an example. Um, in the U.S., we've had to do the same thing because of CCPA, as an example, right? And again, these aren't things, these are not hard things to do. It's more about marrying the technology with a 
understanding of the regulations, with understanding, frankly, working with your partners and your customers who are then oftentimes working you know, on behalf of themselves on Capitol Hill, as an example, right? So it's, it's, no, it's definitely not an easy problem to overcome, but ultimately, context does matter. And so really, truly understanding the use case you're trying to solve for. So is it age assurance or is it age verification? And there is a difference, right? Um, is it trying to make sure that you don't have a bad actor transacting on your platform or is it grow at all cost? And oftentimes it becomes a, a truly a business decision, right? So an easy example of that is we've had, in, in my deep labs and also my visa history, we've had customers or partners who have a fraud problem, a known fraud problem. They call us in, Scott, can you help us? I'm saying, Absolutely, we can help you. And we go and say, hey, nail down this hatchet right there and you'll reduce fraud by 30%. That's fantastic. Um, but we'll also reduce our, our volume by 5%. CFO and CEO, CEO won't be happy. So we'll just accept the fraud problem. Well, wait a minute. You literally are losing tens of millions of dollars per month. And the answer is, yeah, yeah, but we're also gaining hundreds of millions of dollars per month. But wait a minute. That same amount of fraud can then be used to fund terrorist organizations or, or very bad activities. You don't put that in email, do you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to, let's put it that way. Um, and it, it, again, it yeah. com becomes a, a, business, a business call. But yeah. the technology is there. And to, to kind of go along with that, I asked uh, my team beforehand to give me the one question that they wanted uh, me to ask you guys. Uh, and uh, our, our colleague in Utah said, um, He's asking for a friend, he said, to make sure that. He says, uh, will, will platforms just leave certain markets because of regulatory requirements? And if you aren't familiar, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Yeah, go ahead. If you're not familiar, Utah put some, some uh, age restriction uh, laws in place that basically uh, disallow children to, to access certain websites beyond a certain time at night. Um, and porn websites, uh, you know, kind of got a lot of attention. I think VPN volumes actually skyrocketed. Uh, NordVPN <laughs> is probably a great <laughs> lobbyist in DC right now, right? Um, precedence, do you want to set that precedence, right? And what does it gain you? That's the questions you have to ask, right? Let's say you get out of Utah as a company. You're going to do that in Texas now as well? Now you could say, oh, Utah, 3 million people. Hmm, maybe, yes, no. But now all of a sudden, like, do you do the same in Texas, which is going to be even more stringent? if they get their way, um, you know, through, if it gets their way through their house or Florida, right? So I don't think leaving is the right way. I think it's trying to figure out how do you try to meet the regulation, but also show, hey, yes, you're saving 30% in fraud, you're losing 5% volume. Can you show some numbers about what you're impacting? You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to protect children, but look at the impact you're having. Right, what is that impact that is that trickle down effect? So I think leaving is not really an option um, unless you get into like, we must monitor activity for every child. You must send us a report at the end of the day. Like those things now become, I thought you were a privacy regulator. What happened? Right, so I think those are some of the questions you have to ask. Yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll let him and his, his friend know your, your Tell him subscription to NordVPN, five bucks a month, <laughs> right? Like, he did actually ask about VPNs. Maybe we'll come back, come back around to that. But I have, I have some other questions here, and we'll open it up for Q&A in uh, just five minutes or so. But the one question I think is, is really interesting, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about wallets as well. I know we have Steve Wilson and friends over here, uh, session yesterday, talked this morning in the keynote about wallets. Where is the, the interaction with wallets? I mean, obviously Google Wallet exists, a uh, pretty, pretty significant product for you guys built into the Android device. Um, but where do you see kind of that cross section between verifying kids online or, or having folks be able to verify themselves online as adults and kind of this focus on wallets? Wallets, digitizing yourself, right? And so I think wallet is that next step. Um, I think there's a lot of analogies to when payments became online and payments wallets started, right? Payments wallets back in the day, getting an age myself, 2010, 2012. Hey, you wanna have a digital payments wallet? Yeah, totally. Here's a plastic card because the terminals could not accept it just yet, right? And so NFC was not really that reliable. I remember testing 
Google Wallet with a Discover card at a 7-Eleven in the morning when it's rush hour. Everybody wants that good Colombian coffee and I'm standing in line and I'm like making a call. I'm like, am I gonna try? Like, what if I don't have reception? I'm gonna hold up the line. I'm that a-hole with his phone trying to like touch this machine and then it's not gonna work and now I'm gonna have to pull out a card. Like, it was pressure, right? Like, you didn't know what to do. Fast forward to now, with COVID's help, tap and pay. Like, everybody taps and pays, except for Scott's mom, who we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> but now it's... <laughs> Why does he know about that? I don't know. <laughs> um, he's told this story before. Don't get any conclusions here. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not the, that was not the answer. Um, but back to wallets, I think there's going to be a huge curve of adoption, right? Like, you know, wallets have now started, I believe, Apple has five or six states signed up. We don't even know what their international solution is. Uh, Google Wallet has maybe five or six states as well. So I think just the adoption is going to take forever. And then secondly, how inclusive is a digital wallet? If you don't have a physical Gov ID, how are you going to get a digital Gov ID? So there's all of these angles. Do I think we're going to get there? Absolutely. Right? I think everybody's going to get digitized. You are going to prove yourself with this wallet. Provides more control provides more privacy. So I do think it's a solution. I just don't think it's ready just yet. Right, and I remember last week we were talking with Alan Stapleberg, right, group product manager for Google Wallet. And uh, you know, he was talking, he's like, the primary use case for wallets, payments, transit, yep. and then drops off. And then it drops off. Drops off significantly. Because it's not ready. Right, not ready. But he says, but the only way to get rid of the wallet on your person is to be able to have the identity in the wallet. So it's kind of his last piece that he's gonna be focusing on, right? Seems like that. Scott, please clean up my uh, comment about your mom. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to. But <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, uh, you know, your, your comment about um, digital wallets taking off and the, the adoption curve, I, I think it also comes down to the simple sort of fact, right? Which is certain portions of the population aren't gonna have access to wallets because they don't have access to certain devices, right? So my mom does happen to have a device capable of a, of a, of a, of a wallet, but uh, she uses her real wallet, her, her purse, right? And in fact, she still writes checks in the grocery store. So as much as you're sweating bullets when you're going to 7-Eleven, she's the, the lady literally writing the, writing the checks, annoying everyone to include myself when I go with her. So um, obviously we saw an explosion of card not present transactions happening after, let's say, call it circa 2015-2016 further accelerated during the pandemic because everyone was sitting at home as opposed to actually going out to stores and actually make, making purchases. But absent that, you still have the challenges of making sure that you're being inclusive with the solutions. So whether it be people my mom's age or whether it be people who don't have access to devices for a, a myriad of reasons or don't choose to use those devices because they don't trust them or trust the providers, which again, that's still a real thing. Um, it's going to be a challenge for them to really, really take off in my opinion. Yeah. So it sounds like down the line, yes for age, today, not where we're starting. Before I ask the other question, I can just ask a lot to maybe can close those doors uh, over here. I think there's gonna be a session, just wanna make sure people are respectful. Um, last question I have for you guys here, um, which is around, I'm deciding which question I would like here, but really it's about how long do you think the internet is gonna be age aware? Right, so how long do you actually think this, if we're starting three years ago, right, fundamentally thinking about age assurance, age verification, how long do you think it's gonna take before we have an age-aware internet? Maybe you can even explain that term, age-aware, because I know that's something you guys use at Google a lot. Yeah, it, you know, I think the days of self-declared age are over, right? Um, I think the regulations that are coming to the US now, it is, it is really pushing the bounds on you have to figure out who's online, right? What are the, are they an adult? Are they a minor? Are they a teen? What, what is their persona behind that screen? And I think that's gonna, you know, Vietnam has just put out a law that's like crazy, right? They wanna do KYC on everybody that joins the internet and they're painting it as a protecting of kids. So I think that's the, the total spectrum like we're gonna have. Um, I would say, you know, just probably three to five years we will all be proven our age somehow before we can get online or before we act, you know, get access to services. I th it, it is happening now. I think it's not what regulation ever goes away or gets easier. 
none, right? So I think it's just going to get more difficult, and more and more countries, states are going to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, and just to, you don't have to maybe answer this fully for this group, but internally at a place like Google, this is pretty important. I know you write briefings that for Sundar on this specific topic, right? What is the your timeline internally to, to come up with a solution at Google? Uh, the briefings, I use Bard to help me write them uh, <laughs> to make it look better. better. Um, but no, I, I use, use Bard for that. <laughs> These guys don't even know what Bard is. Bard is our it. internal yeah. chat GPT solution. <laughs> um, uh, I forgot the question. <laughs> you're obviously important. No, no, that's what I'm we're not, saying. I'm not important. I'm not you're important. important. You're writing. You're, you're, you're the guy internally for age that goes all the way up to the CEO of Google. How long, basically, before they fire you, do you have to solve this problem? Um, I think, <laughs> so it's funny you mentioned that. Not about firing, but <laughs> we do annual planning. It feels like all year round, right? Um, and so it culminates around October, November about like, hey, this is what we're going to do for the next year. So we had a great plan, you know, going in to 2023. We had a, you know, California was coming in 24. We got to get ready for that. It's a big market. Uh, it's very much like the UK's regulation. So we got to get ready for that. Everybody goes on their Christmas and New Year's break. Next thing you know, Utah comes around. You have Florida come around, Arkansas. Montana, uh, the French government wants to do their own thing. Uh, you have Singapore, India, Vietnam, and all of a sudden like, holy shit, what do we do, right? And so we are really trying to figure out scrambling now. How do we make sure we can try to, never gonna stay ahead of the regulation, but how do we try to make sure we can keep preserving that experience with compliance? And so I think, this year, the rest of this year and 24 is a pivotal moment for not just us, but for all companies that are online to get ready and be ready because you have a grace period about six to 12 months before they start finding you. But Utah has raised the stakes. California is such a big market, right? Number five GDP in the world. And so it just becomes that more ten tangible and more impactful. So I think the next 18 months will show if I'm fired or not. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, why don't we open it up? We have about 10 minutes for questions. All right. Well, yep. I give you I give you the mic, but I'm not. I'll take this first. I'll let Travis tackle the technicals. <laughs> Biometrics are great, but not everybody wants to give their face, right? So it, you have to provide choice to our consumers and our users. You cannot just say, oh yeah, biometrics for the win. It's gonna be great, I'm not denying that, but not everybody wants to give their face. Yeah, well, I have a microphone. Oh, yeah, you have a mic, so. yeah, I took the other one. Um, no, I, I mean, exactly. I think the NIST 863-3 standards run identity proofing are a really good benchmark for everyone here at this conference to say there's a market that's that was validated by the government and the the NIST standards for 863.3 around identity proofing were really for federal employees but we use it as a standard for just about every uh, medium to high assurance use case so very clearly NIST is a very important voice in the room but they're not a regulator right there is they're, they're they're meant to give out guidance and standards and and it's going to be really interesting to see how many folks follow it uh benchmarking is really helpful there is no benchmarking and i think uh even looking at things like i beta certification uh, we do a lot of benchmarking for a lot of different companies at liminal and uh over the last couple of years a lot of liveness detection 
Right. So who's, who's searched or looked up or tried to index liveness detection companies? Can anyone tell me really what's different between the top five? Not really, right? So there is this point where indexing is super important, benchmarking is super important, but at the end of the day, what we found is the clients still said, who made the top 10 or who hit the certification mark? We're gonna invite them in for a data test and see how it works in our use case. That's what I'm hoping for with, with NIST, and, and hopefully they involve a lot, you know, everyone in the room on, on what they're trying to accomplish. Yes, so my question, whenever I talk about age with children, I always kind of look at the other spectrum uh, of seniors and how taking care of their identity. And I could recall, I was talking with one representative from Bank ID, and she was taking her 16-year-old to get his Bank ID, so he was going to become autonomous and have his own ID. But then she was talking about how with her mother, she was beginning to lose some capacity and how she was taking it. Have you looked at that, like those edge cases of identity for youth as well as seniors and how they potentially overlap? Sure. So, so I'll, I'll speak more from a technical perspective than anything else. Uh, I guess what I would offer is that many of the solutions that are either now in place or are being developed. So a little better? Sorry, guys. Um, so from a technical perspective, many of the solutions that are readily available right now, they offer a high degree of efficacy. Fantastic in terms of you know verifying age and, and that sort of thing. I think the challenge does become, again, certain, jurisdic certain jurisdictions, whether or not you can actually still use that technology. So on, on the edge case of, let's say, the, our seniors, it's a little different, obviously, because they would be able to consent, ideally. Whereas for the minors, as an example, yes, because the tech, yes, the technology works, but are you actually able to use it for that specific use case? Do you have permissions from the, from the adult? that's in, hopefully in the room. Um, and by the way, has that consent now changed because the adults now is not in the room to supervise that, that child, that minor? Yeah, and, and to add into that, um, we're all saying mobile first, but for seniors, it's still desktops, right? Um, you know, maybe a laptop, but a lot of desktop. So a lot of solutions, again, we offer that are very device centric will not work for the older generation. So there's definitely, again, it's, we talked about bias, right? You can do an age bias, you can do gender bias, skin tone bias, you have all types of biases that you just, you know about. One, one that I uh, recently, it's not a bias, but it's a thing you have to keep in mind. When you're like, oh, we'll translate. We're gonna translate our solution, right? Like English language, French, German. Well, in Germany, there's a huge Turkish population. If we wouldn't translate, our stuff into Turkish because we wouldn't because they're not part of EU so we wouldn't have it as oh yeah all the language in EU will be taken care of 15 20 percent of the population there is Turkish as their native language they're proficient at that they're not that great at German so again those are things as well that you have to keep in mind uh, when you're doing solutions that truly reach global I had no idea about Turkish just just fun fact throwing it out there I don't know about fun, but... Um, I have a question about entering the age. You said that the days of entering our age or a child entering our age, whatever, on the internet are ending. We don't have to prove our age. How would we do that? Uh, because it sounds like it would be a slippery slope from a privacy perspective. And then, of course, there's that added PII that now has to be protected or can easily be hacked. Totally. Right, I, exactly, you nailed it. Um, just entering your date of birth to get into a website will no longer be sufficient. You will have to prove. Now, how do we prove that in that privacy preserving way? That's also a great experience. I, again, I'll talk biometrics, right? Like doing, doing a face is way more privacy preserving than collecting a Gov ID. I don't need to know your name. I don't even need to know your age. I just wanna have that flag that says, yes, adult, no adult. And so I think that's gonna be some of the solutions that are gonna be out there that are very frictionless, very privacy forward, but it depends on the use case, right? Like maybe you are shopping Jewel. Just to get in, you give your face. But to order, you probably have to give something more. So again, it goes back to that context and what is that use case. But yes, I, I, two, three to five years, again, I'm assuming. Yeah, and, I, and I, one of the learn because you mentioned Jewel really quickly, um, one of the big lessons thing that, that came out of that was 
account creation, so there's a verification element, and then session-based or order-based verification as well. So every time you order something, the, the regulators want to see another age check because the U.S. Postal Service stopped doing age checks. I don't know if you guys knew that when you get alcohol delivered. The USPS doesn't offer that anymore. But, all right, go on. Um, you talked about the US It's a lobby and discussed in Vietnam as, as one of those things. Um, again, it, it's a slippery slope, right? Where do, you, where do you stop? Proving you're an adult is okay, but now do I have to prove that I'm male, female, that I live in California, that I'm over the age of 25, 30, 35? It is a slippery slope, and I think that's, again, why we talked a little bit earlier about how, as an industry, we're doing it all ourselves, going at it alone. How do we come together as an industry saying, hey, it's probably not the right thing we're doing here. How do we make sure we can influence those regulations to be proportionate? Getting on the Internet full KYC is not proportionate. That's why we have a federal government, but. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I would look at a lot of the AML KYC again to kind of go back to looking historically. Um, I used to work for a company called Monitor Deloitte uh, that does like strategy consulting. We bounced around in 2010 to all the banks that were getting you know, cease and desist orders for not complying with KYC regulations. I don't know if you guys all remember this time, but it was pretty, pretty big. And uh, basically, they wanted to put in a basic KYC system that just checked all the boxes, hit the compliance. And I think what we're going to see a lot of, uh, and that, that happened for about seven years, by the way, was everyone just was trying to get the checkbox. Did we comply to the FFIEC manual? Has anyone read the FFIEC manual? Thank you that I was the only one that was about. So anyways, it's the, it's the manual that they posted that said this is what you have to do to comply, and everyone prints it out, and they just checkbox it. I think that we're going to end up seeing a lot of that when we go out and we talk to folks. They're not all Google that have a ton of money and someone even dedicated to it, right? A lot of folks are, a lot of platforms, they're, they're small, right? And so they don't want to have a whole team dedicated to this, so typically it sits in Maybe the, uh, the CIO's office or the CISO's office or the trust and safety team or the C, you know, they just want to comply with it. So we expect that a lot of folks are just going to try to check the box. And if some people are using VPNs, maybe they won't look. They won't care to do that because they're not regulated to do so, right? They're complying with what they've been asked to do. So I think there'll be a lot of discussions with that, but for now, I, I, I'm hearing a lot more conversation about people just kind of looking the other way. A lot to Scott's point about the fraud versus, like stopping fraud versus letting users interact on the platform. A, it's a great last question for us, so you want to talk about it? It starts with the enrollment, right? Did you set your kids up as a kid's account? Or did you like, hey, you know what, I don't want the hassle, I'll just give them an adult account, right? And as Travis opened the conversation, 
a lot of kids lie about their age, right? And as a parent, on their tablets, I have all these restrictions set up, but the fifth time in that day, I'm like, Jesus, do I really want all these restrictions? Yeah, no state of identity podcasts, no. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think it, it's, if, is everything foolproof? No, right? But I do think like companies like TikTok, Instagram, big technology companies trying really hard to try to figure out how to make sure content doesn't slip through, right? Like, is that solved? No, it's not, right? But it also starts with when you onboard, what information did you give us that we can play off of to try to figure out what content we should serve? But it's a massive, it's a massive thing that is not solved. They're still continuously cont working on and really investing in trying to figure out how do we make these platforms safer, more appropriate for your, you know, for your age. Yeah. All right. With that, uh, thank you guys for joining us and thank these guys. Appreciate it.